making more power on a naturally aspirated engine can be difficult. One of the most popular bolt-ons are cold air intakes, which often don't really do much, but if they are configured correctly, so like I'm going to show you today, they are able to make a huge increase in power, sometimes even 10% of the car's horsepower. That, for example, would be about 15 horsepower on a, an engine that has a base horsepower of 150. So that can be an amazing mod if they are built correctly, so they have the right parts selected and not only that, but also are used in a way where they don't suck in hot air and they can actually make use of the engine's rotation. Saying that, starting with the engine itself. As you know, the pistons in an engine or the, the rotating assembly in an engine is operating and therefore the pistons are going up and down in the bore and because of that there is a pulse within the intake and exhaust and that's something that we can take advantage of with building an intake. These pulses within the intake or within the exhaust, in our case I'm going to talk about the intake, these pulses can depending on the length of your intake piping or your intake runners, um, increase torque and horsepower in specific areas of your power band. And this is why, for example, some engines starting in the mid 90s and still today are using variable length intake manifolds. So they have two different lengths of intake runners and a system of flaps that can change the layout and which one is used. Because most of the time, a longer set of runners is able to make more power at lower RPMs than in the longer set. I'm going to go into that in a few minutes. Something that is also important, obviously another factor, is that you should always try to take in the coldest air as possible. So if you can, if that length of the intake piping matches what you are or where you are trying to go you should try to locate your air filter at the coldest location possible usually that's in the bumper or on the opposite side of the headers or at least somewhere where it has direct access to cold air or maybe even a vent from the front that can feed that filter air the other thing is physical layout so there are normal pod filters cheap ones that don't really do anything good but don't really do anything bad for the airflow then there are some other things and these are air filters or pod filters that actually have a velocity stack integrated into them so this is the basically hardware side of things you want to have a look at we are going to start with the length of the intake. This is the most complicated part to start with. As I said, you want to have or want to calculate the length you are going to need for your intake. And for this, we have this intake length or intake runner length calculator. I'm going to link everything in the description so that you can also find it, what I mean. I have put in all the things of my 4A GE engine because in that case it's pretty easy uh, since it's using an ITB setup. So the distance from the valve seat, so that's where it's measured. You obviously have to estimate it because it's not really that precise, but to basically your flange of the filter or rather where the air is actually getting sucked in and that is the calculation. You put in your engine data right here, so cylinder bore, cylinder stroke, and then you get your um, capacity, so your engine capacity. I think you can also just put your capacity right here. That should be fine. There is something that is also very important because the uh, target RPM where you want your peak power to be at or where you want your intake length to benefit you most so for example, if you want lower RPM response, if you want more 
torque down low, you put in like 4000 RPM on there. I would prefer my peak RPM or a bit more benefit at about 6000 RPM and that's how my intake is also configured and I put that in here. Then you also get a runner diameter. That's not really necessary because that's just that uh, your intake manifold should be configured to but that's nothing we are going to worry about today. And then down here we have the duration of the intake valve, which is also needed. If you don't have exact data of your car, then you can also look, for example, on the CatCams website. You can select your car here, your engine. And if you click on the standard camshafts, you can look at what your duration on this it's uh, on this camshaft it's 251 degrees on the intake cam so i have put in 251 right here the exhaust cam obviously doesn't matter in this case as we are worrying about the intake and then we are getting spit out a runner length that would be optimal for that rpm for example if i wanted to increase my power at 3000 rpm then my intake would have been or would need to be uh, much much longer but I'm gonna leave it at 6,000 for demonstration purposes. In this case, I would need to make my intake around 30 centimeters or so long or 60 centimeters. These are a multiple of those because the exhaust pulses, obviously our uh, crankshaft goes up and down and obviously on twice the length, just the other pulse is going to hit uh, the intake valve or rather is going to um, be of benefit for us so you can configure your intake to either one of those values those are the ones that make most sense because a intake of 14 centimeters doesn't really make much sense because that's just too short and an intake of 120 centimeters in this case for example would be first of all while it would take advantage of the pulses it would be at a point where it is actually being kind of restrictive and uh, not optimal. So I would go for the lower one if you, for example, have an ITB setup and on the higher one if you have a normal one with uh, one intake manifold and one throttle body. The tricky part here is if you don't have an ITB setup and are running a normal manifold, well, obviously you aren't going to have the exact same length for every runner because obviously your intake is going to be longer for the for fourth or for the um, for the back cylinder that is going to be for the uh, front or first cylinder if your throttle body is on the on the bottom of the intake manifold if it's in the middle then it's a bit better but you're still not going to have an equivalent length that's not that big of a deal the rpm band where it's going to benefit that engine is just going to be a bit larger and not as drastic because the pulses are going to overlap each other a bit but it's still something you can uh, tweak and still will benefit in the rpm range you set right here so that is the length and if you actually look at the video from 4ag garage who does a lot of dyno testing you can actually see where your or where the for my engine, for example, he's using different camshafts, etc. So this might vary a little bit because I'm using a stock engine, he's using a modified engine where the intake runner length benefits the engine the most. That's the length of the intake until the basically beginning of the pot filter. As for the diameter of the intake, this should be at least the same size as the throttle body. There should be no edges in there and as least amount of sharp turns as possible. Make the turns as large of a radius as you can, if possible, or if you're using turns, because as air has a mass, it is not really effective at turning very sharply and is going to lose flow characteristics when you are using sharp turns. And it is retaining those more when you're using a more fluid intake path. So uh, that's also very important to consider. And 
using short bends will actually also reduce power again from the peak number you would be able to generate. Then again, a benefit for intake temperatures would be wrapping the intake piping in gold foil so that it would reflect any heat um, that is coming onto it. While it is obviously suboptimal to put anything that is intake related near a header or a manifold, um, wrapping it in gold foil can still improve intake temps a bit. You do not want to thermally insulate it like with exhaust wrap or with, for example, thermal insulation like I showed in my uh, video to, manifold, uh, to wrap a manifold because that will just keep the heat in and not reflect it outward. So wrapping it in reflective tape will work while insulating it obviously will not. Also, you can obviously use a heat shield if needed if you ha have hot components nearby, for example, on an uh, MX-5 or Miata engine bay. If you're running the filter to the right side of the engine bay where the manifold, the exhaust manifold is also contained, then a heat shield might be a good idea to run because then you are shielding this uh, compartment of the air filter from the exhaust manifold. Also, a gold foil on that heat shield might be a good idea to keep that compartment cool. Yes, that actually helps quite a lot. The last thing would be the filter. This is also where it gets really important. And uh, if you do not want to spend 100 bucks on an air filter and just want to get a cheap one, I am going to provide some links to 3D print files for velocity stacks to different um, measurements in the description. And if you don't have a 3D printer or something or just decide to buy a filter that has an integrated uh, velocity stack, you can buy one from ProRam. They offer ones that have a uh, integrated velocity stack and they just are basically using that. This can give you massive improvements if you, for example, go from a normal filter to this. Uh, there are, in comparison to a normal filter, will give you about three or four horsepower, which can be quite a bit uh, on a, for example, 150 horsepower car and for really not a lot more money than you would spend on a normal filter. Even the K&N filters don't really have an integrated velocity stack, although they cost a similar amount of money. They only have a small radius, which isn't gonna do that much. So it really makes sense to get something like this. And as I said, with this intake, you would be looking at a, depending obviously on your engine, uh, as I said on, for example, a Miata, a 1.8 NB Miata, you are able to make about 10 to 12 or maybe 15 wheel horsepower, depending from what setup you're starting at. If you're starting from a stock setup, you are probably going to be looking at 10 to 12 wheel horsepower, which is quite good for just an intake. Yes, you might need a programmable ECU because you are not going to see as big of a benefit from the stock ECU, obviously, because while yes, the MX-5 engines do run very rich, um, in stock form, you might be able to gain maybe seven to eight horsepower. I don't think that you will be able to uh, make use of the complete gains. That's it for this video. I hope I could help you with uh, configuring your own intake and building your the best cold air intake possible. And uh, yeah, you can also let me know what experience you have with colder intakes. Maybe you, you have some different tricks that you um, wanna share. And as always, I wish you a nice day and goodbye.